Good afternoon. I think we're ready to start. Um, grab your lunch and take a seat. Okay. Um, welcome to this forum sponsored by the Charity and Security Network and the Constitution Project. My name is Kay Ganan. I'm the program manager of the Charity and Security Network which is uh, an advocacy and education campaign launched in November 2008 aimed at bringing down barriers to legitimate operations of U.S. nonprofit organizations that are created by our national security laws as they now stand. This includes disaster relief, aid, development, human rights training, and peace building and conflict resolution work. Our method of doing that is to draw on the expertise and experience in the nonprofit sector to offer concrete and practical alternative approaches, and that's part of our current campaign and work. Um, because the material support laws in, uh, create such incredible barriers and difficulties for legitimate operations of all kinds of nonprofit organizations, we've been very concerned about the humanitarian law project case and tracking it closely. Um, and now that the case is at the Supreme Court level, we wanted to take this opportunity and join with our, our colleagues at the Constitution Project to provide uh, information on what is a complex uh, case that is easily misunderstood. So thank you for coming. Uh, thank you to our panelists for being here. Um, and thank you also to the Connect US Fund for supporting this event. So I'd like to join Kay in welcoming you all here today. I'm Sharon Bradford Franklin, Senior Counsel with the Constitution Project. And I want to also thank the Charity and Security Network for co-sponsoring this event with us. For those of you not familiar with the Constitution Project, we are a bipartisan nonprofit organization that promotes constitutional safeguards through our rule of law program and our criminal justice program. And most relevant to today's uh, panel is the work of our Liberty and Security Committee, which brings together people from across the political spectrum to work to ensure that we promote both our national security and our civil liberties. As you all know, we're here today because next Tuesday, the Supreme Court will hear oral argument in the case of Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, a constitutional challenge to certain provisions of the law that prohibit material support to groups that have been de designated as terrorist organizations. The basic goals of these laws is not controversial, namely establishing that it is a crime to provide various types of aid or support to terrorist organizations. However, as our panel of experts will explain in more detail, the material support statutes extend beyond punishing conduct that supports terrorist activities and broadly prohibit various types of aid that human rights groups and peace building groups might otherwise seek to provide. We have two goals here with today's program. First, to explain the full scope of the material support prohibitions and the legal and practical problems they create. And second, to clarify that the case before the Supreme Court is actually fairly narrow and to outline what issues actually are and are not before the court. The Constitution Project has been involved in these issues in two ways, with a report we released and with an amicus brief in this case. And uh, copies of those, as well as materials from Charity and Security Network, are outside of the table when you came in. Um, our report is entitled, Reforming the Material Support Laws, Constitutional Concerns Presented by Prohibitions on Material Support to Terrorist Organizations. In this report, our bipartisan committee noted that while cutting off support of terrorist activity is an important and legitimate part of the United States counterterrorism strategy, the existing laws on material support raise serious constitutional concerns under the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments. Our report includes eight specific recommendations for reforms, some of which would require action by Congress, and others of which could be handled by changes at the agency level but only two of our eight recommendations are actually relevant to the case before the court and could be resolved or at least ameliorated by a favorable judicial decision rather than through legislation or agency regulation. First, we recommend that Congress should amend the definition of material support to ensure that if pure speech is punished, it is only if that is intended to further illegal conduct. And second, we make a recommendation that would be partially addressed by a favorable court ruling, namely that Congress should carefully craft an amendment to expand the currently very narrow exemption from the definition of material support for humanitarian aid, which currently covers only medicine or religious materials, 
and our committee has recommended that it should be expanded to include such humanitarian aid items as medical services, civilian public health services, and if provided to non-combatants, food, water, clothing, and shelter. And only the part of this recommendation that would allow services would actually be addressed by a court ruling in favor of the Humanitarian Law Project. And as I mentioned, based on this report, the Constitution Project, together with the Rutherford Institute, filed an amicus brief in the Supreme Court in support of the Humanitarian Law Project. Our brief focuses on the First Amendment issues in this case and urges that the challenge provisions of the material support statute prohibiting service, training, expert advice or assistance, and personnel to designated groups chills free speech and association in violation of the First Amendment. We have an expert panel here today to explain these legal questions and the potential impact of the court's ruling. But before I introduce them more specifically, I want to let you know how we're going to proceed. First, Professor Steve Vladek will describe the legal issues that are and are not before the court and will provide an overview of the material support statute. Next, Shana Kadidal will outline the litigation involving the Humanitarian Law Project, including the types of aid the group seeks to provide and the impact of the current restrictions. He will also discuss various legislative proposals before Congress for reform to the material support statutes that would extend beyond the narrow questions before the court in this case. Finally, Professor Lisa Sherrick will discuss the broader real-world impact of the current restrictions on peace-building groups and her own on-the-ground experiences in trying to conduct this work. After these opening presentations, I will moderate a discussion briefly among the panelists, giving them a chance to respond to each one another, and then we'll open the floor up to Q&A with the audience. So just, you do have um, programs before you with more detailed bios of the panelists, but I just want to give you uh, some highlights here. Our first speaker again will be Professor Stephen Vladek, who is a professor um, at American University's Washington College of Law, where his teaching and research focus on federal jurisdiction, national security law, and constitutional law. He uh, was part of the legal team that successfully challenged the Bush administration's use of the military tribunals in the landmark case of Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, and has been active in authoring and co-authoring a variety of amicus briefs in various lawsuits challenging uh, government surveillance and detention policies. Our next speaker will be uh, Shana Kadidal, who is senior managing attorney of the Guantanamo Global Justice Initiative at the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York City. He has also been very active in uh, working on the Guantanamo uh, litigation and representing detainees, and is actually co-counsel for the Humanitarian Law Project in the case before the Supreme Court and uh, throughout the litigation before that. Lisa Sherrick is a professor of peacebuilding at Eastern Mennonite University and also is the director of the 3D Security Initiative, which promotes civil society perspectives on conflict prevention and peacebuilding in US security policy making. She has worked in over 20 countries as a trainer, consultant, and facilitator in peacebuilding programs. So with that, I will turn this over for opening remarks by each of our panelists. Great. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thanks to the Constitution Project. Um, this is actually, I think, a very useful event because, at least in my experience, uh, it's actually kind of tricky to explain what is and what is not at stake in this case. Um, and so to that end, I have the rather onerous uh, responsibility of simplifying this case into a seven-minute presentation. So we'll see how that goes. Um, this all begins in 1994 when Congress, for the first time, uh, creates a criminal restriction in Title 18 of the United States Code that makes it a federal crime to provide material support to terrorists. Um, and the 1994 statute defines material support uh, as currency or other financial securities, financial services, lodging, training, safe houses, false documentation or identification, communications equipment, facilities, weapons, lethal substances, explosives, personnel, transportation, and other physical assets except medicine or religious materials. Um, in 1996, in the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, Congress adds a new provision in Title 18 that also makes it a crime to provide these kinds of material support to so-called foreign terrorist organizations, or what we'll probably refer to a lot on this panel as FTOs, um, who are designated as such by the Secretary of State. Um, and the designation uh, as an FTO actually has three distinct legal consequences. Uh, 